Come join Melissa and her guests on the Chats from the Blog Cabin podcast. From North Carolina, this podcast will have you feeling like you've known these folks for years. Listen in as they chat about life, culture, current events, and more, all with a special Southern flair. Curl up with your favorite beverage and get ready to be entertained. Tune in now for a unique experience that's fun and insightful. Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of Chats from the Blog Cabin. You know this show where I virtually invite people into the Blog Cabin to chat about life. And today we're chatting about spring, even though it's not spring where you are, Susan. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Susan is the author of the Vegetable Garden Problem Solver Handbook. So before we start talking about this book, let's talk a little bit about you. Tell us a little okay. about yourself. Sure. So my name is Susan Mulvihill, and just right off the bat, I better tell you that I am passionate about vegetable gardening. So we're going to have some interesting discussions here. <laughs> I, I live in Spokane, Washington, as Melissa said, and that is located about 300 miles east of Seattle. I know a lot of people when they hear Spokane or, or Washington State that they're thinking, oh, it's, you know, it must be really rainy and cold and wet there all the time. But actually, we're almost to the Idaho border. And so it is dry here. And we get quite a cold winter. As a matter of fact, we still have snow on the ground. It's in the 30s right now. And I am just counting the days until spring gets here. <laughs> so my husband, Bill, and I live on five acres um, in a rural area of Spokane County. Our hardiness zone here is 5B. We mostly grow in uh, raised beds, which we think are really cool. I have been a garden columnist for the Sunday edition of the Spokesman Review newspaper here for about 18 years. Wow. I've been a master gardener for 21 years now. And I shoot a weekly video about different types of gardening topics. And it is such a great way to teach folks about different methods in gardening. It's a great way to connect with folks. And as you mentioned, I'm the author of the Vegetable Garden Problem Solver Handbook. I'm also the author of the Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, which is all about vegetable garden insects, actually both good ones and bad ones, and co-author with a dear friend of mine, uh, Pat Munz of the Northwest Gardener's Handbook, which is a regional gardening book. And I just feel so strongly about sharing the things that I've learned over the years so that people can be successful gardening. Wow. How did you get into gardening, first of all? Well, uh, it's, it's a nice story. Uh, my grandmother introduced me to gardening uh, right off the bat. I think I was just a few years old. She lived in Pasadena. I'm originally from Southern California, as is my husband. And um, so every now and then, you know, we'd go to visit my grandma and um, she was an amazing gardener and she would take me out into the garden and show me what was growing. And she said, let's plant some seeds today and, you know, do things like that. She also grew um, boysenberries. And, you know, that's a great way to be introduced to gardening because <laughs> I thought those were pretty special. But the cool thing is, I really come from a gardening family. My mom was a great gardener. I have three sisters. Uh, two of them are also master gardeners. One's retired now. And uh, the other one should be a master gardener because she's an amazing gardener. So, you know, we're just totally a gardening family. And um, so it just has been a part of my life all along. Uh, first of all, there's two things I want to talk about. First of all, Got to get a shout out to Pasadena because my <laughs> oldest daughter actually lives in Pasadena. Um, really? they're, going, they're going to college out there. Um, her husband is going to Caltech and she's going to UC Irvine. So oh, Okay. <laughs> that is very cool. So shout out in a beautiful place because I just went and visited for the first time ever last summer. Oh. And it is so beautiful. So walkable. I just wow. love with it. You know, I have a cool memory um, because my grandma lived in Pasadena we only had to walk like two blocks from her house to watch the Rose Parade. Oh. And that was like the highlight of my life <laughs> back in those days. We, you know, we'd stay overnight with her and then we'd, in the morning, we walk, walk to Colorado Boulevard mm -hmm. and um, watch the floats going by and everything. And it's just, just really cool. 
And for those that watch the Big Bang Theory, my daughter would say, Colorado Boulevard, there it is. There, there's Caltech. <laughs> there's the, everything else with the Big Bang Theory. That, that's yeah. Done. Oh, that's funny. Second thing is, what is a master gardener? I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, what is that? Sure. It sounds like I should be highly exalted, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like you should have a cap and gown. Like you that's know, right. You know, I should, and maybe a crown as well. There you go. <laughs> So the Master Gardener program has been around quite a long time. Uh, we're celebrating uh, here in Washington State that our, uh, oh golly, now I'm going to say, I'm going to say the wrong year. I was going to say the 50th year. I think that's right. <laughs> but um, uh, it, Master Gardener programs are affiliated with land grant universities. So here in uh, Spokane, that's uh, Washington State University. Um, there's Oregon State University and so on. And um, so what Master Gardeners are, um, we go through special training um, in all different aspects of gardening, whether it's, um, you know, ornamental plants, pruning, growing vegetables, growing berries, um, you know, house plants, diseases, insects, everything. And so we go through uh, quite a lot of training for a few months and then, uh, and do testing along the way. And then we, so we become volunteers to the public. And so uh, here in Spokane, and I know this is the case pretty much at all Master Gardener programs, which are through, throughout the U.S. and Canada, by the way, I should mention that. But we have a plant clinic that people can come into um, or they can email us and, you know, photos of a bug on their plant so we can identify it for them and tell them how to take care of the problem. Um, all of our um, services are free and um, or people can, you know, uh, just send us an email about something or they just walk into the clinic during clinic hours and we do our best to help them solve the various little challenges of gardening. That is so awesome. And you're using all the knowledge that you gained, plus knowledge that you gained from your grandma and growing up yeah. um, to create these books. What made you decide to create the books that you created? Well, there's a little history behind that. And, and since you brought up with the Master Gardener thing, both with uh, my time with Master Gardeners and then just as a garden writer in general and a columnist, I get asked a ton of gardening questions. And I love a mystery. I love to be able to solve the problem for folks. And I would say the number one question I'm asked is, what is that bug and how do I get rid of it? <laughs> and so I kept getting those questions and about, oh, maybe three years or so ago, I was thinking, you know, I really need to research what would be a great um, reference guide to refer people to. You know, I don't mind answering the questions, but I thought there must be something that I could, ref you know, refer them to. And so I kept looking and everything I found was either not about vegetable gardening or not like real relatable to gardeners, or it was so technical that, you know, it would make your eyes glaze over and you'd think, I really have no idea what I just read. Mm -hmm. So I thought, hmm, maybe I have to write the book. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I belong to a professional organization called Garden Communicators International, and yeah. we with the exception of the pandemic, you know, we have a conference every year and they set up a, a thing called pitch sessions where you could pitch a book idea to the top editor, you know, garden book editors mm -hmm. across the country. And so I thought, oh, that's kind of scary, but I'm going to go for it. And so I rehearsed my pitch over and over and over, you know, you only had five minutes to pitch it, you know, and I'd rehearse and it's like, oh, it's eight minutes. Okay. What can I cut out? Okay. Now I'm going to rehearse it again. And so I finally got it. I made a nice um, sort of a handout that went with it and I totally nailed it from all of those practice times. And the very first person I talked to was Jessica Walliser, who she's she's a fabulous garden book author, but she is the uh, acquisitions editor for Cool Springs Press. And there are tons mm -hmm. of wonderful gardening books out there that Cool Springs Press has published. And actually, they've published all three of mine. But um, she was 
very interested. And she said, um, give me a call when you get back home from the conference. And I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? <laughs> so I called her up after we got back home and we chatted about it and, and thought about, you know, how could this book be put together? And so the next thing I know, I'm writing the book and uh, it came out in March of 2021. And then I really wasn't planning to write another book so soon <laughs> because for anybody out there who's listening, if, if you are a writer, you know how much work goes into writing a book and then promoting it afterwards. It is a ton of work. And so I thought, you know, I really need a break. So what happens about, I don't know, four months after the pest handbook came out, I got an email from Jessica and she said, you know, I was thinking about your next book and I'm thinking, no, <laughs> I'm thinking about my next book, I'm not, I need a break, you know, but I didn't say that. I was very polite. And she said, I was thinking maybe you could write a companion book to the insect book that's about vegetable plant diseases. And at the time I was thinking, well, first of all, I really need a break. And second of all, I thought if a book that's only about vegetable plant diseases might not be that much in demand from gardeners, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. And so I, I told her, you know, um, I just, I just don't think I could write that book. And, you know, if you want to ask another author, you know, you have my blessing. <laughs> and um, so anyway, the more I started thinking about it, I thought, okay, in addition to vegetable plant diseases, there are a lot of weird things that we gardeners encounter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in addition to the insects, which I addressed in the pest handbook, there's, you know, we have weather issues. We've got germination and pollination issues. We've got weird plant disorders that aren't caused by diseases. Mm -hmm. We've got, we do have the vegetable plant diseases in, in some areas of the country, probably including yours. Um, mm -hmm. There are probably quite a lot of plant uh, diseases that you deal with because you have more humidity and, uh, you know, just a different climate. And then, of course, I started thinking about, well, we also get critters in our garden. So things like um, deer, we actually do get moose, <laughs> um, <laughs> rabbits, squirrels, porcupines, you know, gophers, mice, you know, all these different things. And so the more I thought about it, I thought, well, I could see something like that being all put together for gardeners in a very easy to understand uh way and that this would be something that uh, would be useful. So I sent Jessica an email and I said, okay, have you talked to another author yet about your idea? And she said, no. And I said, I had this idea for this book. And she said, send me an outline because publishers love outlines be mm -hmm. because it really helps you nail down what you want to write about and how you're going to present the information, how you're going to organize it and so on. And I, I live by my outlines because it really helps you write the book. So I sent her the outline and I got an email back and she said, I love it. And I thought, <laughs> what did I just do to myself? <laughs> yeah, oops. But um, so that uh, I signed the contract to start writing it in October of 20 oh golly let me think about this that must have been 2021 and then it came uh it just came out about three weeks ago so it's um hot off the presses but i am i have to tell you in all honesty and and i mean this in a humble way not not in a bragging way i'm so proud of both books i'm so mm -hmm. pleased with how they're laid out, how the information is presented. It's very organized. I keep hearing that from folks over and over. I love the way you present it. And I present it so that a brand new gardener will understand it. Mm -hmm. And a seasoned veteran is also going to, to uh, understand it. So yeah, I'm, I, I'm really glad I did it, but oh boy, do I need a break. <laughs> Well, guess what? We need a commercial break right now. So we'll go into a great segue for a commercial break. And then we'll be right back to chat more about gardening. 
people welcomed me and they knew the pain of the journey that we'd been on because they'd been there too. Other Parents Like Me is an online community, peer-led, for parents with kids struggling with mental health and or substances. It's a space that's safe, it feels like I can actually share what's going on. We offer 15 daily support groups per week and live speaker talks on Thursdays as well as a monthly expert panel. We also have a resource hub that has a toolkit. This includes over a thousand articles, podcasts, there's a glossary with the most recent and relevant terms, and we have a directory that's been vetted. The overwhelming feeling when we're sitting in a meeting and I'm telling my story and I see others shaking their head, tears falling, you know, they understand this roller coaster and they're along for the ride. And we are back chatting with Susan about her book, The Vegetable Garden Problem, Problem Solver Handbook. And I absolutely love, like you said before the break, the way it's laid out. It's absolutely perfect because it, the different um, titles and the way it's laid out that someone can just automatically just flip through it and flip to what they need instead of having to go like in the glossary or in the index and say, oh, X, Y, Z, this is what I need to look for right now. I love that. What made you decide to put it in that kind of outline? I think more than anything, I just wanted to uh, make it easy for people to find the information they needed and uh, to put it in a logical order. Mm -hmm. And it did help writing the pest handbook um, before because there are, well, first of all, they're laid out in similar manners and um, they uh, you know, they both present the information in a similar way. And, you know, I think that I just tried to make it really usable. It has over 200 photos in, uh, well, actually 200 in the pest handbook and 200 in the problem solver handbook, because, you know, some of these things, they're really hard to pinpoint what the problem is. But if you can look at these different photos and go, oh, that's what I've got, you know, then you at least have a starting point to uh, track down the information. Yes. And even you even have charts and things like that, because I'm looking at the ones for the bugs. Yes. And you have a chart about, I like the very beginning was talking about starting, you know, how far apart you should put your plants. Right. A lot of people try to put their stuff all together and then they realize, wait a second, I ain't giving enough room to grow. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a huge issue. Um, I, I know that we gardeners want to cram as much as we can into a bed, but we don't realize that um, when you don't space plants appropriately, different things happen. For one thing, the plants are stressed because they're competing with each other for moisture, nutrients, space, sunlight, all of that. And they also... Um, it also causes, uh, it makes plants stressed to the point where uh, insects will come to them and munch away. And it also can be a way for diseases to spread. If the plants are all crowded together, the pathogens can move from plant to plant very easily. So yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I talked about um, uh, as ways to keep plants healthy. Um, some of them maybe might seem like no brainers to uh, gardeners who've been uh, growing plants for a while, but sometimes we forget the basics. You know, we forget that, oh, I guess maybe it is important to water our plants regularly, you know, and be, be a little better about that or um, using a mulch on the soil surface to, you know, keep the moisture in and make it hard for um, foliage on plants to touch the soil, which might be where those pathogens are. So there's, there's a lot of things that I included in that first chapter Um is, is just kind of, for the for the seasoned gardener, a reminder of why these things are so important and for the brand new gardener to get them started off on the right foot. Is there any one particular vegetable that you think should have its own little section in the garden where you shouldn't plant anything else around it? <laughs> um, hmm, that's a good question. 
I do know uh, the, the, the funny story behind uh, part of the book um, in the second chapter, um, that's the one that's all about the vegetable plant diseases. Okay. And, um, and actually I'll go backwards for just a sec. So in my vegetable garden pest handbook, the one that's about the bugs, I kept thinking, boy, you know, sometimes it's really hard to know what's munching on your veggies. Mm -hmm. And maybe you don't see the insect, maybe it's nocturnal. And so you don't see it anywhere, but you see this damage on your plants. And so I made this huge chart that's listed by the crop that you're growing. So let's say you're growing um, peas. You would go to that part in the chart and in that vegetable garden pest handbook, you could read descriptions of the type of damage you might see on the plants. And that would point you to, oh, this insect causes that damage. This insect causes this type of damage. So as I was putting together the vegetable garden problem solver handbook, I was realizing that, boy, a chart like that would be really helpful because I'll be totally honest, diseases are really complex. Mm -hmm. They're you know, some diseases, they have the same kind of appearance, but they've got some unique things about them. So I decided for the new book, I was going to create another massive chart. And again, organized by all of the most commonly types, uh, commonly grown types of vegetables, and then put descriptions of what the different types of diseases would look like on that particular crop. And then each of those descriptions points them to the name of the disease that would cause those types of things to be on the plant. Mm -hmm. And th that, that was one of the things that I felt like the organization of it was really helpful because it's so hard to go out to the garden and go, hmm, that plant looks funky. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's wilting a little, maybe some part of it has died, maybe there's holes in the leaves, but not like holes that an insect would cause. You know, maybe, um, maybe it's, it looks like it had somebody sprinkled bread flour on the top of the leaves, you know, that, that's powdery mildew. Um, and so I felt like if they had a sort of a starting point, you know, okay, I'm growing corn and what in the heck is this weird gray stuff? You know, they go down to the descriptions and, oh, that's corn smut. And so there's, it's just a, a way to help people um, figure out what they're dealing with. Now, in that chapter, then there are um, profiles, as I like to call them, of each of those diseases. And so it explains, is it a virus, a bacteria, or a fungi, that's, uh, fungi that are causing this? Um, which crops most commonly deal with this type of, of uh, disease? what it looks like on the plants, and then a description of what it, that particular disease does to the plants. Because, I mean, it, it is fascinating, aside from being really annoying, <laughs> that, <laughs> the plant disease. And then I have a whole list of organic strategies for how to deal with the problem, whether it is um, being able to use an organic product like a fungicide or something that will either control the disease or prevent it. So using it proactively, if it's, you know, if you have a disease that you deal with year after year after year, you know, you can anticipate that, okay, that's probably going to happen again. So here's what I can do to prevent that from happening. Um, so I have a whole list of all different kinds of things people can do to um, reduce the chance or maybe eliminate, which should be really nice, um, the chance of disease in their gardens. I just love that. I love the fact that you already mentioned something about the organic ways, because the more pesticides we put out, the more it, it harms the environment. So let's talk about some of the organic ways that you can help, that you can garden. Okay. Okay, so um, one of the things that I did also, it, since that chapter two is all about plant diseases, as I was, you know, I was so focused on the diseases, you know, and, and, and what do they look like and what causes them and so on. And then as I was putting together the organic strategies, I thought, oh, this is really important for someone to do uh, to 
uh, hopefully eliminate the problem or reduce the chance of it happening. And then I thought, okay, so while I'm in chapter two, after I've written about all the diseases, I'm going to write more detailed explanations of what these different uh, methods mean. So, um, you know, I've mentioned about not crowding, overcrowding your plants, that that's a problem. Um, keeping up with the weeding. I mean, you know, nobody likes to weed. However, I actually, although I have to say, I, I don't really mind it, but it's because I stay on top of them. So it's not <laughs> overwhelming. But what a lot of folks don't realize is that there are some diseases that um, there are weeds that are alternate plant hosts for them. So if you've got mm -hmm. that particular weed in your garden and, you know, that's just one more home for it to live on, even like through the winter and then, you know, start the problem all over the next, the next, uh, uh, the next season. It's also uh, the, that mulching of the soil surface is so important because, um, you know, I mentioned how it's going to keep the help the soil retain its moisture, which is really important when it's super hot. It's also going to make it harder for weed seeds to germinate. So there is a plus. But again, not having those plants, uh, their foliage touching the soil surface where there might be pathogens, that is a real bonus. Another thing folks should do is let's say you're growing tomatoes and tomatoes do have a lot of um, disease issues or can, I should say, depending upon where you live. Um, and, you know, stake them up so their foliage is off the ground and even cut off those lowest branches, um, you know, once the plant has grown a bit. And then um, that's eliminating that chance that um, those pathogens could get splashed up onto the leaves. Um, another thing would be if you have uh, a plant that does have a disease, don't compost the plant material. Put it in a bag and take it to your trash can because most home, home compost piles are not hot enough for a long enough period of time to kill those pathogens. Another thing folks can do is to, and should do, is to sterilize their equipment like pruners, let's say. Let's say you're pruning off uh, some diseased leaves from a plant. You want to sterilize in between cuts, in between um, plants. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I explained in the book is that you um, shouldn't use bleach to clean metal tools because what it does is it pits the metal which makes it more prone to rust. And it also makes nice little cozy pockets for the diseased pathogens to take up residence in. You don't want that. So what's safe to use, and fortunately is super inexpensive, is rubbing alcohol. That works great. And I have talked to some folks where they even have like a little, a little jar of it, you know, uh, like in a, a gardening apron or on a holster or something, and they can dip it in. Uh, dip the pruners in in between cuts. The, you can use bleach to do, um, uh, oh, like clean out your fl your flower pots and your seed starting equipment, that type of thing, just not metal stuff. The other thing that works well for disinfecting uh, metal tools is hand sanitizer. And I'm pretty sure everybody has some yes. in their houses these days. And then uh, one thing that I thought was interesting is as I was researching these different diseases, I discovered that there are a lot of disease resistant varieties of different types of crops. So uh, I put a chart in the book. I'm like the queen of the charts. <laughs> <laughs> I love that and, though, because it's so it, easy to find the information. Yeah, exactly, and that was my goal. But um, I, I made a chart that is of the, um, acronyms or abbreviations of the different types of diseases. And so that way, when you're searching for seeds, whether it's, you know, in a seed catalog or in your favorite garden center, look for those initials as being a disease that that variety is resistant to. So, I mean, that is a great option. And I had no idea before I researched it, just how many are out there that are resistant to um, some pretty nasty diseases. So yeah, I really wanted to give people a lot of information about what we can all be doing to keep our plants healthier.
Yeah, you gave a lot of information. You mentioned something earlier too um, about the critters that can get in your garden, <laughs> like, like a deer. I know for us, deer and rabbits are huge. Oh um, boy! You said moose. You you, you said mo moose, right? You had a moose, or was oh, it? Yeah, oh. we get we get moose where we live, um, and usually just a few times a year. And um, the best thing you can do to keep them out, I don't know if anybody's listening who, who deals with moose, but um, we have a seven and a half foot tall deer fence that is around, um, it's always hard to des describe uh, something like this, but uh, we have an orchard, a small orchard that's out front where we have our apple trees and uh, plum trees and cherry trees and so on. And it's so the, the rest of our front yard is completely open but the orchard is fenced the veggie garden is fenced and the immediate backyard is fenced and then that way we keep things like that out but yeah with deer and moose um a, a tall barrier is the number one best way to keep them away from whatever it is they're after <laughs> yeah i've heard things like you can like human hair sprinkling around the <laughs> And then some, some people even said, go around and pee around your perimeter. I've <laughs> not heard of that one, but. <laughs> you know, I didn't think to include that in my book. I, it, it is uh, uh, true that the smell of, of human urine does um, make some, some types of critters think, oh, there's people here. We better skedaddle out of here. <laughs> Yeah, but that's that to me. That's like the per, you know the perfect thing because everybody's got to pee somewhere. But can you imagine going around peeing around your whole house? I mean, that, around your yard, and your neighbors will be looking at you like, "What are you doing?" I know you have to be discreet. <laughs> so, what about squirrels and the other squirrel? We have a lot of squirrels, gophers, moles. Yes, yes. So the uh, if I can remember this off the top of my head, um, the the type, well, heck, I've got my book right here. The, um, just to start off, the, the critters that I wrote about are um, birds. Believe it or not, I get a lot of emails about people saying the turkeys, the, you know, the finches, the, you know, whatever, uh, chipmunks, deer, pocket gophers, groundhogs. Now, where we live, we've got marmots. And I don't know if you have marmots there, but um, they're like your basic groundhog. Um, mice, moles, opossums, porcupines, rabbits, raccoons, rats, skunks, tree squirrels, and meadow voles. So, you know, I tried to cover the most commonly encountered critters. And when it comes to dealing with different types of animals or birds in your garden, there's sort of three categories of um, how the the approach you can take. And so one is to repel whatever it is away from your garden. Another is to um, scare them away from your garden. And then the third category is some type of a barrier that will physically keep them away from whatever it is they're after. So how, how would you scare them away from your garden? For uh, squirrels or... Yeah. Or basically okay. anything. <laughs> oh, just anything, anything. <laughs> You're desperate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, in the scaring category, um, there are a few different things. Um, one, and this always makes people laugh, but there are motion-activated sprinklers. If you have a deer or raccoons or rabbits or whatever that that come a certain way to your garden, what you can do is um, this is a sprinkler that has a motion sensor on it and you can set it to a certain height and to a certain width of an area that that motion sensor is monitoring. And you hook it up to a hose, you turn on the water so it's basically charged. And then anything that triggers that motion sensor gets blasted with a strong jet of water. And I always tell people, just don't forget where you put it <laughs> because <laughs> you might be on the receiving end of a whole bunch of water. <laughs> well, in North Carolina, that might be a really good idea is when it's really hot outside. <laughs> yeah, you might enjoy it. it. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a pleasant little surprise. <laughs> 
but that that's a good thing to scare uh, to scare uh, a lot of different types of critters with. Um, another thing that I use, uh, and and I have to preface it by saying, um, when you're dealing with critters on a regular basis, you have to get creative. <laughs> and so uh, one thing that I use, it's really successful, and people look at me like I'm nuts, but you know, if it works, I'm I'm going for it, and that's why I shared it in the book. You can scare different types of things like birds or uh, squirrels or uh, raccoons, uh, some uh, uh, different types of things, rab you know, rabbits with these toy snakes. So you go to like the dollar store uh -huh. and you, you know, it's not a big investment. You buy some of these little toy snakes and some of them look pretty lifelike. I mean, not 100%, obviously. And what I do is I move them around in the garden and it has worked really well. Now, uh, a problem that we have when it comes to birds is we have um, California quail, which are absolutely gorgeous birds. My husband and I are avid bird watchers. So, you know, we have mixed emotions about this, but they're just gorgeous birds. And both the male and the female are wonderful parents that, you know, we love to watch them raising their little chicks and everything. But when they go into the veggie garden, what they do is they like to um, eat the leaves off my lettuce. I have issues with that. <laughs> they like, you know, spinach, um, beans like bush beans they just it's, you just see a whole bunch of little pecks off the leaves it's these little bites and that's what they do and they usually leave the stock <laughs> which is kind of rude yeah. so what i do is i put um these toy snakes here and there in the garden and it has worked like a charm and i know it sounds silly you you know if i kept them in the same spot all the time Mm -hmm. uh, and this applies to a lot of different tactics um, for different types of animals. If you don't move things around, they get acclimated to them. Mm -hmm. And so you do have to move things around. But I don't mean like, you know, 10 times in a day. I mean, like every few days. Um, but that has worked well. Um, there's also uh, mylar um you can call it, it's called either like mylar ribbon or mylar tape. And that's that real flashy stuff. And you tie it on two ends, or actually you could even just tie it on one end, let it blow in the breeze. But some of them actually make a buzzing sound when the wind blows. And that is, has been very successful. Sometimes uh, you can use pinwheels because they're turning. So there's that motion Maybe they're making a little thump as they go around. And maybe if it's made of something that's uh, very reflective, you know, it's also flashing little lights, mm -hmm. you know, to it. So, you know, there are some very simple things you can use that um, are very effective. Okay. I've got to know, since you said you put toy snakes through the garden to scare <laughs> critters away <laughs> it ever scared you you've forgotten when there's one and walked up on one you're like <gasps> okay so <laughs> i <laughs> i have um i think i got used to them pretty quickly so that's good but the hilarious thing so i don't know if you know who joe lample is but he is an amazing uh gardening celebrity and he's actually a friend of ours um he does a, a public broadcasting um program called growing a greener world and it's a wonderful gardening program and it's about good stewardship and organic gardening and all these things well they came and filmed in our garden um in a about, I want to say 2017. And his photographer, Carl, apparently is very scared of snakes. And so we'd be walking around in the garden deciding, you know, where are we going to set up this shot and what are we going to cover and so on. And he'd be behind me and every now and then I'd hear, because ah, ah, <laughs> he's seen these, these snakes. <laughs> <laughs> so I've gotten to the point now when someone is in my garden for the first time, I always warn them that okay, there's these little plastic snakes here. They're fine. Don't be worried about them. But <laughs> It is funny. Have you ever come across a, a real snake thinking it was one of those that you'd placed out? I, I haven't done that, but I have. Uh, we, we don't get 
a lot of snakes uh, within our garden, but um, sometimes we do see like a gopher snake. And um, those are fantastic predators for things like mice, rats, voles, gophers, et cetera. And so, I mean, I, they always freak me out because I never see them till the last minute when they slither and then I go, <laughs> but, um, but I do know they're great predators. So we just let them do their thing. Now we talked about predators or, or critters in our garden. We've talked about some of the diseases. Now, what about things that are really out of our control, like drought and the pollinators? Because now they're, there's the bees are slowly going away because yes. the environment. So let's talk about drought first, and then we'll talk about the bees. Okay, sure. So um, I have to say, you know, all over the country, people are dealing with really severe weather. And it's uh, been uh, pretty alarming. And I, you know, in my first uh, garden column of this season, I was kind of joking that, it would be really handy to have a crystal ball because, mm -hmm. you know, so you could plan and be prepared for anything that comes, comes your way. But um, certainly we have had some amazing heat waves. I, I say amazing, not in a good way. Um, heat waves and droughts. Um, two years ago, we were up in, uh, at uh, I think 115 degrees and that is just way too hot. But um, so for dealing with, with heat waves and drought, um, I strongly encourage everybody to put that mulch on the soil surface, uh, because again, it, it helps the soil keep moisture within it and it can be, um, uh, grass clippings from your lawn provided, I always have to add this you don't treat your lawn with uh, weed and feed because that will kill your vegetables. Um, but if you don't use anything like that, you're good to go. Otherwise you can use shredded leaves. You can use weed free straw, but anything to put on the soil surface to help it retain its moisture is good. Um, certainly you're going to have to increase the amount of time that you're watering your garden. And then the other thing is uh, shade cloth really comes in handy. And if you live in an area where you're dealing with, uh, you know, heat waves more and more, it's a really good idea to invest in a little bit so that you can protect some plants that are really tender. And it does help quite a lot. Um, you can even use shade cloth over things like um, lettuce crops that, you know, they're a early spring crop and they usually um, go to seed when the weather starts getting quite, you know, hot. But if you put um, the shade cloth uh, suspended over the, over the plants, don't just drape it on the plants because that traps the heat. But um, that is a way to get them to grow a little bit longer because you're giving them a nice little bit of shade. But I'd say uh, definitely uh, increase the amount of watering that you're doing. Um, and my mantra this year is water the soil, not the plants. The plants' leaves do not need to be wet. Um, just water the soil because that's where the roots will take it up and deliver it to the plants. And I know sometimes, you know, if a, a person has an overhead watering system, that's just how it is. Um, so that's okay, but be good about watering your plants really early or watering your garden, I should say, really early in the morning so that the leaves will dry off very quickly. Because when you have wet leaves all the time, especially going into the evening, that can help disease pathogens move from leaf to leaf. That was my next question. When was the best time to water? And you already yeah. answered it. <laughs> it's like I'm reading your mind. Uh -oh. <laughs> Let's talk about the pollinators. Okay. And you're absolutely right that uh, it, it's frightening um, how much trouble uh, pollinators are having. Uh, I should clarify, it isn't only bees. Um, you know, there are a lot of other types of pollinators and um, really, uh, there are a few things that you absolutely should do. So one is don't use pesticides. And, you know, I know that sometimes that's all a person knows. You know, I have this bug and I want to kill it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to use, I'm going to, you know, I'll go to the home center or the garden center and I'll buy something. 
that kills whatever it is I'm dealing with. The problem is that pesticides are non-selective. And that means that in addition to killing like the aphids, let's say, it's also going to kill the beneficial insects that would have helped control the problem for you. So I try to let folks know that you, you absolutely must stop using um, pesticides because, I mean, this planet's all we got. So we, you know, pollinators are huge. If you, if you think about all the things that are in your kitchen and your refrigerator, I mean, not a hundred percent of everything needs pollinators, but a huge amount. So the other thing I wanted to mention about um, uh, the chemicals is that it's not, uh, it's not just the pesticides that can be a problem. So when I was writing the Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, I was looking at all of the organic products that uh, gardeners frequently have access to at a garden center. And so when I, I decided I should do a section that describes how these different products work. And so I did, um, you know, all these different commonly used products like neem oil and spinosad and horticultural oil and so on. And one of the things I included in each description was if there were any precautions. And some of them are toxic to pollinators. Holy cow. So it's not just because it's organic. That doesn't mean you, it, it absolutely won't kill pollinators. It just means you need to be smart when you apply them. So super early in the morning before they're active or very late in the day when they've gone home for the day, as I like to say, <laughs> um, don't spray flowers because that's where pollinators are going to. And um, so it's not that you can't use those organic products, like neem oil is one of the ones that people swear by, but it's toxic to pollinators. <laughs> and so it's just be aware of it and, and apply it at the right time of day. And then plant tons of flowers, flowers with different kinds of flower heads. I have never yet had anybody say, but I don't want to plant any more flowers. <laughs> we all want flowers, right? Mm -hmm. But the reason for the different flower heads is that um, different types of pollinators have different types of mouth parts. And so they, mm -hmm. certain types of flowers accommodate those mouth parts. But yeah, plant lots of flowers in your veggie garden too, because it will look cool and it's going to attract the pollinators. See, I did not know that. I did not know they all had different mouth parts. So that's yes. pretty cool. Yes. That, that actually brings me to my next question. <laughs> when we were talking about your first book, your second, you didn't want to write your second book. Uh, the whole time <laughs> I've been thinking, well, what about flowers? You're a master gardener. What about your flowers? Are you going to write a book about flowers next? <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking a break, <laughs> no matter what anybody says, except my husband and I were just saying over lunch, I said, okay, what would somebody convince me to write a book about, you know, and I was thinking, well, maybe an actual vegetable gardening book that's all of the nuts and bolts with each individual plant or something, but um, yeah, I'm taking a break. <laughs> so what flowers do you suggest? What flowers do you have in your vegetable garden? That, uh, well, sunflowers, uh, they really attract pollinators. Um, zinnias are great. Um, nasturtiums, calendula, um, marigolds. Uh, what am I forgetting? I mean, there's just so many different ones that attract. Uh, and I, I usually think in terms of annual flowers, you know, that grow just in that single season, because I'm always moving around where everything grows each year. And that way I don't have something in the wrong spot. But there are a ton of great uh, flowers that you can plant to attract the pollinators. And a side note on marigolds, here in North Carolina, we have mosquitoes like crazy. Uh, great mosquito repellents as well. Ooh, I didn't know that. Yep. That's very good to know. <laughs> so when should we start planning our garden? Like, I know you probably already have your garden plans out, right? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I admit it. <laughs> there you go. Well, um, it, it's never too early, I think, to, um, you know, to think ahead about what you want to grow and where you want to put it. 
Um, I do follow something that's a, a concept that's called crop rotation. And a lot of people think, well, that's just for big farmers. But it's a way that I... Uh, I think prevent disease issues in my garden. And it's it's complicated to describe it quickly, but I'll do my best. Okay. So basically, um, certain plants are susceptible to certain diseases. And so like take tomato plants. You don't want to plant tomatoes in the same bed year after year after year, because if they do have problems with diseases, those pathogens are down in the soil. And so if you plant tomatoes there again the next year, well, guess what? You got the same disease again. You do it again the next year, same disease. And so what I do is I actually have a little template and I should have brought a copy of it with me, but I do use it to lay out my garden. And usually I start with tomatoes and I think, okay, where did I grow tomatoes for the last two or three years? I'm not going to plant them there this new year. Unfortunately, it goes a little farther than that. Uh, tomatoes are members of the nightshade family. So that's also eggplants, peppers, tomatillos, and potatoes. So again, when I'm laying out my garden, I say, okay, where did I grow tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, <laughs> potatoes, and, and I'm going to pick a different bed to grow the tomatoes in. And it sounds complicated. It, it isn't once you get into the hang of it. Um, and so I plan that out fairly early. Now, my husband, Bill, who is like the most awesome guy on the planet, he has really gotten into vegetable gardening in the last maybe 10 years, let's say. It used to be just me. And um, so th the problem that we have is that as much as we love each other, we're sort of politely fighting for space in the garden. <laughs> and so I'm always like... Where are you going to put the peppers? Because he's the pepper grower. He likes to grow um, like cherry tomatoes and grape tomatoes and um, onions and, you know, all these different things. And so we have to kind of coordinate a little bit. There's a little give and take. But um, but that's what I, I, you know, plan that out right away. And then I'm looking in garden centers and in seed catalogs. We get quite a lot delivered during the winter, which is perfect wintertime entertainment. Yeah, yeah. And look through and see, is there something new that maybe I'd like to try? Or like I was saying earlier, do they have some kind of a new tomato that doesn't get early blight or late blight or, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, it is, the planning is just so much fun and it's what gets us through our cold winters here. <laughs> I don't know about you, but, um, you cold winters too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes me feel better, <laughs> but, um, yeah, planning is a very good idea. I, you know, heartily recommend, you know, thinking it through, uh, don't get carried away, especially if you're a new gardener, don't overextend yourself because what will happen is if you don't have enough time to dedicate to the garden, um, you are going to get overwhelmed and not be able to take care of the whole garden. So, um, you know, start small early on, uh, you know, pick like four crops that you really, really want to grow. Maybe you want to grow a couple tomato plants and some bush bean plants and um, lettuce and onions or something, um, you know, start small. But um, yeah, I mean, growing vegetables, growing your own food is just amazing. I love it. Well, there's so much more that I want to ask you, but our time <laughs> is almost up. Is there one last little nugget that you would like to share with us? Oh, talk about where we can find your books and where they can find you. Oh, I'd be very happy to talk about that. <laughs> okay. I was thinking, oh, a nugget from the book. I'm, I'm totally lost. So uh, let's see. I post daily to Facebook and Instagram and my uh feed or account is under Susan's in the garden. And I say that slowly because a lot of people don't realize there's an S in the middle there. So it's S-U-S-A-N-S -S -S in the garden. Um, it, that's the whole name. I uh, post a video to YouTube uh, every week on different kinds of topics. I've got you know, over 470 videos <laughs> wow. and um, that's youtube.com slash Susan's in the garden. And then my website is 
Susan's in the garden dot com. <laughs> and I only have two of the books up, but the one that we were talking about today is the vegetable garden problem solver solver handbook. <laughs> and it's on Amazon, but where else can you get it? Oh, you can get it at all of your uh, local independent booksellers. Um, you can get it at places like Barnes and Noble um, in your town. Um, it's it's available all over. As a matter of fact, this this book and the Pest Hand book have been marketed all all over the world because it's that universal. So not just for the states, not just for Canada, you know, the U.S. and Canada. It's being marketed in um, the U.K in uh, Germany, France, Japan, Australia, I mean, all over the place. Um, so if you're listening from far, far away, you probably can find it. But yes, uh, Amazon is an easy way to find it. And the other book is the Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook. I don't have the other one up there because I didn't realize you co-authored that oh, one. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. So here's the Pest Handbook. Let's see if I can hold this in the right spot. <laughs> there you go. Yes. And um, unfortunately, the third book is a, a leap away. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got beautiful rhododendrons on the front. And it's, it is a regional book for um, Washington, Oregon, Northern California, and Southern British Columbia. Wow. And you're taking a break. You're yes. Be in your garden. <laughs> I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would love for you to come back and talk about maybe in the summer or in the fall, talk about fall gardening and winter gardening as well, because a lot of people like to winter garden, you know, some of the mm. crops that we could do. So okay. I think that would be very interesting. Okay. So guys, I will put in the show notes everywhere. You can find Susan as well. So find her a lovely book. I mean, just the pictures alone is worth buying the book. So you don't have to sit there and go, okay, this looks like this. This looks like this. You can actually go to the pictures and the charts right. and find exactly what you're looking for. <laughs> um, Susan, thank you so much for coming on and for sharing about gardening. You can definitely tell you're passionate about it. I am. Thank you so much, Melissa. Great to meet you. And I appreciate being a guest on your podcast. Okay. Like I said, guys, I will have everything in the show notes for where you can find Susan as well as check out her YouTube. I'm going to go hop over there and check out her YouTube as well, because I want to learn more about gardening. <laughs> so we will see you guys on the next chat from the blog cabin. I'm getting tongue tied right now. <laughs> so bye guys.